Welcome to the Smith Publicity, all things book marketing podcast, the best tips, insights, and advice from the best in the publishing industry. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Michaela Della Monica. We are thrilled to kick off our first podcast of 2017 with our Director of Business Development, Corinne Mulder, who is here today to give us valuable information on what authors should consider when hiring a publicist. Hi, Corinne. Hi, Michaela. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. Dan and I, Dan Smith, is here as well, the owner and CEO of Smith Publicity. Hello. Hi, Dan. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well, and we should say that Corinne just returned from maternity leave. Yes. Yes, happy to be back, happy to be putting my adult brain to use again. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right, so let's get started, and let's kick things off. Um, you know, I'm sure our listeners uh, would love to know what important questions an author should ask a potential publicist. When looking into hiring a book publicist, there are so many uncertainties and questions that really should be addressed before making such a a big investment. Uh, One of the the things that I often feel in working with authors to determine if we are a good fit for them and vice versa uh, is really answering what similar campaigns and projects we've promoted. Any publicist that you are considering Hiring, you really want to be sure that they have experience working within the genre that that your book falls into, just as you would an editor or a cover designer. You really want to make sure that there's familiarity with uh, with the contacts that would be most applicable to the the content of the book. I think another important question is to um, ask who's going to be leading the campaign. And I think something um, that we're going to be addressing is, you know, working with a, a bigger company versus an individual. Um, so sometimes that, that question is answered right away. Um, but in, in hiring a publicist, uh, you may be working with a team. So to find out exactly who's going to be leading the campaign initiatives uh, is just going to give you peace of mind again before making uh, such a a big investment. Um, Another question, and maybe it's not so much a question as it is, uh, you know, really coming prepared with what your answers are, um, is to really relay exactly what your goals and expectations are. Um, If you are to tell a reputable or trustworthy book publicist what your goals are, and they honestly feel that the services they offer are just not in line with with helping you achieve those goals, they'll let you know that. Um, it's it's going to be, um, you know, better peace of mind before starting on a campaign when you've spent so much time on your book uh, to really make sure that anyone you're hiring is is very aware of what your expectations are. Um, and, I, and another question I think that's just extremely important is, How much communication can you expect from your publicist, from your team? Um, Again, it's it's a big investment, um, and it's an emotional investment as well when you're turning your baby over to someone uh, who you may not even meet in person to handle uh, being a voice for your book and and getting it out there. Um, So to find out how much communication you're going to have and what method uh, works best with the publicist you're going to hire um, is something you should definitely know before jumping into to a campaign. Absolutely, absolutely. And our industry is such a niche industry. There are a number of us out there, but on a larger scale, there aren't that many of us out there. So <laughs> much like shopping around, you know, for the best car for your family or the best appliances, you know, quality and, and price – um, should an author talk to multiple publicists, even if they feel comfortable with the first one they talk to? Michaela, great question. The answer is absolutely yes. Would you just buy the first car that you test drive? The answer is probably not, uh, unless you're, um, you know, a car enthusiast and did your research. Uh, the truth is, every publicist, every marketing professional 
they're going to have their specific niche. Um, you know, no one can really do it all. I think that's something to keep in mind when you are shopping around uh, to be a little leery of, of a firm or a publicist who really, you know, says that they can do everything you're looking for. I think what you're going to find as you begin interviewing potential candidates to hire um, is that everyone has their niche within the niche industry that you're you're talking about, Michaela. So to, you know, even if it's just to give yourself peace of mind before, again, uh, jumping into a, a very large investment, an emotional investment, um, shopping around is is very smart. And um, it's just going to give you probably even more questions to ask other professionals as you're you're working to make the best selection. Absolutely. Um, and in today's world, it is so easy to encounter um, publicists and, and some firms out there just by doing a Google search. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes you also may encounter Yelp and, and other review sites out there that allow you to look inside the company, you know, in a quick way and to just, you know, skim and read through some reviews. Um, and, you know, when authors see negative reviews of a publicity firm, and, and we can use ourselves as an example, because we have such few negative reviews out there, um, but they're important to talk about and, and to, you know, go over if, if a potential client has questions about them. So why are mm-hmm. reviews like that posted, and, and what should authors keep in mind when reviewing those? Well, I think uh, for the purpose of shopping around and interviewing publicists, negative reviews, like you said, Michaela, can actually be a great point of leverage in in determining what are the best questions to ask a publicist. So, you know, we've been in business now for 20 years this year, Dan. Yes. uh, Which is very exciting. And And 3,000 authors. 3,000 authors. And, you know, I, I, you know, would be uh, dishonest to say that, every campaign was was an ultimate home run. I mean, there right. are um, a, a lot of factors that play into a publicity campaign and, and how it unfolds. And when you are uh, met with negative reviews um, about someone or a, a firm that you're interested in hiring, I would really use them as a catalyst for questions. Uh, for, for me, again, in working with so many authors to develop plans and coordinate uh, campaign options, the negative review to me, I found, um, can be a, a big discussion point for laying out, again, the expectations and goals that an author has at the, the very forefront of a campaign. Um, I also think a lot of times it comes back to mismatched um, expectations on exactly what the publicist is, is going to be focusing on, and a lot of times what's in our control. Um, because, and, and that may be a question you have, uh, but publicity is, is not a guarantee. It's not advertising that we're, we're doing. We're working on earned placements. So we can't control exactly how the media is going to respond to a book or how a reviewer feels uh, about a book after they've read it. Um, so with all the things that are out of our control, there are the, you know, it opens up the door for um, negative reflection on a campaign, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a reflection of the work that was executed. And, and I think it's, as you mentioned, we, and, and using Smith as an example, but it's certainly, um, in, in fairness to all the firms out there, in our case, as you mentioned, we've worked with approaching 3,000 mm-hmm. authors, and in total on the internet, there's at a maximum, you know, perhaps four or five negative comments um, out of 3,000. And we actually, and you can elaborate on this a little bit, and, and again, if you see authors see negative reviews of other firms, it's important to look at it in context. In our case, again, as an example, four or five reviews, negative reviews, or somewhat negative reviews in some cases, out of 3,000 authors over 20 years, we actually use it as a point of pride that that's all we have. I mean, that's a pretty impressive record. And other firms, maybe, you know, they can say the same thing. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the percentage of negative reviews that we have um, is very, very low. And, and it's important, again, um, when you're looking at any firm, you may see negative reviews, but 
go to their site and see all the testimonials. In our case, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of positive testimonials. So I think take everything in balance um, and keeping in mind that, you know, it's so um, easy for anyone to post a review. And sometimes they do it without even really give it some some thought. You can type it, you can post a review within minutes. And Mm -hmm. um, so I think, again, with any firm, when you see negative reviews, as you said, to put it in context in the total realm of how yeah. long they've been working. Yeah, it's inevitable it. any company is going to have. Use it so, as fuel for questions to dig yeah. deeper and, and you know why accounts mm-hmm. may go bad. Um, that mm-hmm. is actually another question to ask before right. you hire a publicist. And a lot of times I think you'll find if, if you've done your research, you've come across negative reviews, um, that the reason campaigns can go bad would be reflective of, of some of that intent behind a negative review. Right. So it's and, a great question to ask. Yeah. And, and it, good for you to do the research. Right. And um, I'll follow up with that in terms of, and Michaela mentioned it, I think, early on, that um, does the size of a firm matter? In in, in our niche world, um, Smith Publicity is actually considered one of the largest book publicity firms. But we're still a company of around 20 people. So we're still a small company, but we're large within the niche. Um now there are there are a lot of sole practitioners out there, and some of them do great work. Um, there are one or two people firms. There are firms that approach our size but aren't quite as big. Um, and I, and sometimes we get, ironically, for from our humble beginnings, and sometimes we'll get now the question from a prospect that you know, well, you're too big. We're going to get lost in the your um, be a small fish in a big pond, so to speak. How do you, what do you tell authors when they ask about, you know, the size of the firm? Does it matter? Are we too big? Is What are the pros and cons? Sure. I, I think you can look at that from, from a couple different ways. Working with one individual publicist, a one-man show, that's going to be your point contact from, from the very start. Um, so you are able to build that relationship right off the bat. They're going to be taking your campaign on and, and executing the project. So, you know, the bond that you're forming, I think it does begin right from the beginning, which is, um, I think, going to give a lot of solace to an author who, again, is, is making such an emotional investment. Um, and also the, the publicist who is the sole executor um, is, is most likely typically working within a genre that they're most comfortable with, that they have experience in. So I do see there uh, being a positive to working with with a one person firm or a small and, and, and before, smaller firm. And before you get to the flip side of it, uh, the advantages of a multiple person firm is, um, as I know from my own perspective, when I first started off and I was just a sole practitioner, it's important to keep in mind that that there are advantages to that. But that person, as I know from my beginnings. Is also their the accounting department, their right. the billing department. They're handling multiple things, so they can be stretched in a number of different ways out of necessity. But, you are right about that, and and it is something to consider if your publicist then has a sick day or a family emergency. What happens to your campaign? And it's not to say you shouldn't give it a, a fair shake if you have that connection with the publicist, but those are things to keep in mind. Uh, you know, we are a firm, as Dan said, of, of roughly 20 people here and, you know, constantly evolving in, in how we approach our campaigns. The benefit that I see to working with a, a larger company um, is just the creative energy within the team. And that's not something that you'll necessarily see, um, but just sitting in the office and hearing the back and forth about uh, different media, uh, you know, contacts that are coming about and different trends that are emerging, um, bouncing pitch ideas off of each other, I, I think it's it's invaluable with, um, with the team approach that we have. Also, on the flip side to the possibility of a one-man show kind of, you know, going going out on a maternity leave or some sort of sick leave, um, we always have backup for each other. We are a team approach from the very start. And while I'm the director of business development and not necessarily executing a campaign, you know, everyone that is involved in the success of a campaign from the very start to the very end um, has such a connection to the author and to the book. And we're really able to jump in and work together to, um, to, to correct 
any sort of path that might be going off in a direction that's not working for the book, um, or at the very least be a support to the point publicist to make sure that there's no stone unturned and um, and there's never any break in, in activity in the campaign. And, and we, can, we have, at firms such as ours and others, we have redundancy, like you said, if someone, you know, unfortunately gets sick or something happens, we, there's no, it's a seamless transition, the campaign continues. It is, Dan, and, and I think one thing to keep in mind um, about the idea of a large firm, it's as large as, as we make it. Um, we still have very individualized campaigns for specific genres. We know the publicists that work well with specific genres. So it might seem bigger in terms of the staff size and the number of publicists. But again, in asking who's going to be your point publicist uh, before you make an investment, um, I think you'll find that the right firm is going to really partner you with the most appropriate fit. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I can I can jump in there and speak to that as well, since I am a publicist here at Smith and I do, you know, come to an office that is open space and, and much like a newsroom format where everyone is sitting very, you know, next to each other and, and conversing and bouncing ideas back and forth off of each other. You know, it is it, it's very valuable, I think, you know, from a publicist perspective um, to, to really have that information and those colleagues close, close by. Um, so, you know, I think I'd be interested also, Corinne, to ask you about, uh, retainer based firms versus pay per placement, um, or specific media firms that work in those formats. You know, what's the difference between the two? Maybe perhaps give background on those two methods and, and what seems to work best. And also what they can expect to pay. Sure, yeah, exactly. sure. So um, we are a retainer-based firm, which means that um, we charge for the campaign up front and then the cost of coordinating interviews and confirming coverage, working with our, our clients day in, day out, that's all covered within the cost. A pay-for-placement uh, is, is vastly different in that you are working with a publicist but only paying for cost once coverage has emerged. And I will say that sounds quite appealing when you're talking about, uh, you know, no guarantees uh, that you'd only be paying for, for things that do emerge. Uh, but on the flip side, that can be quite costly. If you have a book that really takes off or you're in demand for interviews, that adds up quickly. Um, whereas within a retainer campaign, you're never going to pay more just because you have more activity. Um, you know, you do have to be careful as well with pay for placement that it's not just going, you know, for the lower hanging fruit or easily attainable uh, coverage opportunities um, because that, again, can really add up quickly and, um, and, and perhaps you end up paying much more than you would for a retainer type of, of relationship. Um, and I think cost in general, it's important to know that right off the bat and something to know about um, your own uh, set of, of you know, um, points before going into these publicist interviews. The, uh, the cost and your marketing budget, you must have an idea of what your marketing budget is because things will ultimately sound very attractive to you once you start talking to different publicists and find out all the different cool initiatives that they can carry out. Um, so make sure you have your budget firmly in place. You know what you can spend. Don't stretch yourself right off the bat because marketing doesn't uh, marketing and publicity success doesn't happen overnight. And you may you know want to continue on in some capacity. But to have an idea of what cost would be, and I can really only speak to that from a retainer um, side because we're not pay for placement. Um, a full service, robust campaign with activity week after week, you could expect, um, you know, industry wide to cover any uh, to to pay anywhere from, uh, you know, low three thousands to upwards of five thousand a month, maybe even more, depending on the elements that are included. Um, and then, you know, there are a number of firms like ourselves and different publicists who offer. Uh, lower cost book marketing support services. A flat, flat fee service. A flat fee service. And, and we offer services that start, you know, in the 200s 
um, topping out around 2000 which are still going to give you the benefit of working with a publicist, um, kind of dipping your toe in and kind of testing it out before maybe jumping into something so, more so, expensive. So, and I know we're, we're uh, running a little longer than we target here, but I, it's such an important topic. Um, so we're, we're at our core where Smith is a retainer based firm. However, we, over the years that like you mentioned, added flat fee services to, um, address, you know, people with more limited budgets, um, which I think is important. And, and, and again, I think over the last five years, we now have that range, like you said, from $250 to full blown campaigns that, you know, can, it, it can be pretty pricey, yeah. but you know, we are, selective. Um, we're not recommending campaigns that are a stretch for an author, both financially and for what, you know, where their book could take them. So again, partnering with the right publicist, you really should expect to be able to work out a campaign plan that best suits your budget, that suits your goals, that suits the content of your book. Um, I actually have a lot of fun putting together some creative campaign timelines that probably drive some of our publicists crazy, but make our authors very happy when we can come up with solutions that are really in line with, with the uh, important factors an author's looking for. And, and since we have the benefit of our host, Michaela, being a publicist, Michaela, I think it's, it may be important to address to authors, um, if someone's paying, for instance, we have a media introduction service, and we don't mean this to be promotional, but just for example, mm-hmm. that might be $1,900, and then we have someone who's paying much more. Is do you treat that client any differently, or you know, is it is it part of our approaches? You know, everybody gets the. I don't want to answer the question for you. I'll let you. Yeah, do, do you absolutely. treat them any differently? No, no. I would say no. First and foremost, I mean, I approach my campaigns in the same mindset um, as any other. You know, I. I'm a very creative person. I bring to the table very creative ideas to to all projects. So, uh, you know, and oftentimes I really don't pay attention <laughs> to how much they're spending just because, you know, it, it's really, you know, jumping into things and kicking off right away and seeing what angles to tackle. Um, so, no, that that's definitely not of, of consideration on my part firsthand. That's, that's really one of the principles we, we rest on is we know – that it's not just a, a costly investment, it's an emotional investment. This is your baby. Um, you know, writing the book is half the battle, but it's a battle that I wouldn't want to do. <laughs> I don't have the guts for it. So uh, we know that it, it's it's a, an investment that comes from a lot of different places and um, it's treated with respect. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Corinne, for your time and and your expertise and valuable, valuable information here. I'm sure our listeners really enjoyed this discussion today and and hope that they they take away, you know, um, some really great pointers from you. And and thanks for your time, Dan, as always. You're welcome. My uh, nice sidekick over here. (laughs) Um, and, and be sure to connect with us, folks, on social media. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter, at Smith Publicity, as well as Instagram. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Smith Publicity. All Things Book Marketing Podcast. To reach us and learn about our many book marketing services, visit www.smithpublicity.com. Or send us an email to info at smithpublicity.com.